The Dukes of Dice are brought to you by Tasty Minstrel Games. Check out all their awesome titles at PlayTMG.com. Welcome to the Duchy. It's time for another episode of the Dukes of Dice podcast, a proud member of the Dice Tower Network. Coming to you from the Duchy in the Duke City, Albuquerque, New Mexico, it's the Dukes of Dice, a podcast about board card and occasionally role-playing games. Today, the Dukes review both Capital Lux and Blood of an Englishman. Then they look back at the review of Viticulture in their Dukes double take. And finally, they talk about a big announcement for the show. And now, the Dukes of Dice. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. This is Sean. And Alex. And this is episode 121, Lux Lux Goose. Nice. Name courtesy of Chris Schreiber over on our Board Game Geek Guild, Guild number 2008. Chris, congrats on naming this episode. Alex, how many is that for Chris? That is lucky number five. Ooh. No one actually ever says lucky number five. No, no one It's ever... just number five. So if you don't know, we name all of our episode titles with the help of our awesome guild members over on Board Game Geek. You can go over there to our Dukes on Deck thread that we put up every week, which talks about what we're talking about in the forthcoming episode. You can add your contributions to games that we're talking about and help name the episode. So, uh, of course, Lux Lux Goose, kind of like Duck Duck Goose. We're talking about the capital Lux and there's geese. Well, I guess there's, there are it's, two it's geese. A golden, it's a golden goose. Golden goose. Which or is a goose in, that lays golden eggs. Sure. I think. Yes. In blood of an Englishman. That's yes. one of the trophies you can get. So it was super clever. Yes, very much so. All right. So congrats, Chris. And uh, at the t- bottom of the episode, we will tell you about some of the runners up to the naming for the week. Uh, but we got a little bit of show business first. The Fantasy Board Game League that our buddies over at Draft Mechanic were running. So uh, Jake and Danielle. I should really say Danielle and Jake because Danielle did the lion's work. All, all, lion's, lion's share. Lion's share of the work. She did She did lion's work she, there. Yes. Um, so she did all of the spreadsheet stuff, which was an incredible amount of work. I kind of did it like at the beginning of the first week just to kind of get a feel for where we were all at. And, and for just me, I think it was just me, and it took me forever. So... Um, so great work to both of them for running this. Uh, so this was uh, an ongoing thing that went like like 11 weeks, 12 yes. weeks with the playoffs, I think. And um, basically we had drafted a bunch of teams. And let me check my notes here. Oh, I won. I'm the big winner. Yeah, you are. Oh. So you were, you were toe-to-toe with Matthew in the finals. Yes. So a couple of, of locals here. Matthew playing as team first mention. Uh-huh. And I was the picture that he used <laughs> yep. as a mascot referencing baseball tw- highlights 2045. First mention. First mention, first mention. Which is the first yeah. mention of, yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, he lost, bringing great shame upon uh, my name and uh, and Baseball Highlights 2045. Uh, therefore, he has now lost the the rights to my likeness. Okay. Well, I won. I'll need my attorney to help enforce that. <laughs> Team Duke Doodle Doos was the, was the big winner. <laughs> Which is the most disturbing mascot ever. <laughs> yeah, so it's a it's a chicken, a fighting chicken, a fighting, uh, fighting rooster with, uh, instead of a head, though, it's got a little meeple, a little Duke meeple. The, yes. The, the deeple. Yes. The do eeple. Yes. Do eeple. My team, the uh, the Albuquerque Fisters, uh, fell fell off the face of the earth. Unfortunately, uh, we we start off pretty well, and then I just didn't draft ahead of time. Like I think you guys drafted games that were going to be hot. Right. 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 And I didn't. I just kind of drafted games that I thought would get me a lot of plays. Sure. That were kind of old standbys. Didn't pay off. Didn't work. Well, I had the first round draft pick, which was Scythe. And Scythe, oh, yeah. Scythe was a solid performer. I mean, it started off much stronger when the plays were a lot higher, but it was still solid throughout. And then um, I was I was dominating most of the league, and then things were – like everyone else was kind of getting better and better. And I'm like, uh-oh, I'm going to have a problem here. Fortunately, I had drafted Feast for Odin mm. uh, and was waiting for it to come in. And so finally when it came in off the bench – after Essen and I and I put it in, it performed incredibly well. So so side kind of kind of put me on the map and Feast for Odin kept me kept me going sure. uh, to the finish there. So it was it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it and it was just cool kind of being able to trash talk and and uh, it was fun. Meanwhile, you've completely ignored the fantasy football league That's that spurred true. off of that <laughs> to the point where David Johnson has been sitting on the bench for weeks and weeks and weeks. Oh. Should he not be? No, he really shouldn't. Oh. He's he's really good. He's probably the best running back in the NFL. Anyway, uh, so way to way to ignore what you also started, Commissioner Sean. Whoops. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, that's yeah, that's true. That's yeah. true. I, my, my my bad. Um, <laughs> but uh, back to the fantasy board game league. I'm paying a lot of attention to that fantasy football league. On separate note, anyway. Uh, I'll go up. I'll update my roster. I'll oh, great. Yeah. Yeah, you're already out of the playoffs. Oh, is the playoffs started? Not yet. Uh, but oh. soon. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, you're not. You're done. Okay. Don't don't even bother. Next year, I'll. I'll oh, next year. Yeah, next year, I'll. I'll focus oh, okay. On a little bit more. But uh, no, back. Okay, once again, back to the fantasy board game league. So Jake had mentioned to me that they're actually putting together a trophy for the fantasy board game league, which they're going to be sending out to us, and we're going to go put on display at Empire. Board Was that game. Ducal us? Because I don't. I don't get that trophy. I didn't. Well, make, no. Make the play. Well, no. I it's I I won it for the duchy. Oh, did you? Yes. Oh, cool. So you Ducal, we won. Oh, excellent. Yes. Perfect. So we're gonna put up on display at Empire, so the whole duchy can can bask in its glory. So uh, yeah. So thanks again, Jake and Danielle, Draft Mechanic Podcast. You should go give them a listen if you haven't done so already. They talk about board games and and uh, craft beer, microbrews, both topics that I enjoy greatly. So, Very good. Yeah. Uh, Patreon. Hey, we've got a Patreon. Page. If you go to patreon.com forward slash Dukes of Dice, you can help support the Dukes over there. And we just want to mention, uh, give a shout out to a brand new Patreon backer, a Duke level backer. What? We need like, Duke, 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 Duke. Yeah. Or wait. <laughs> Little sound effect. Wait, wait. Put it in post. Duke, 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 Duke. Okay. <laughs> uh, Daniel Diamond. And I, th- I, I think this is our buddy, Daniel Diamond. I'm going to be shooting him a message. Agent of Chaos, Daniel. Yeah. So um, if it's not, if it's a different Daniel Diamond, I apologize for just assuming that you're someone else, but I'm going to find find out who for sure. Uh, so yeah, Daniel Diamond is our brand new Duke level backer. So just want to say thanks to Daniel. And uh, yeah, if you're so inclined to go check out that page and possibly support us, we would definitely appreciate it. So Alex, let's talk about some board games. Yeah. What'd you play this week, Sean? So this was kind of uh, another slow week. So I'm feeling better. I was, I was pretty sick two, two weeks ago, still kind of feeling it last week. Um, Chewy was sick this week. Oh no. Raquel was feeling kind of under the weather. And then the last two days has been in in pretty bad shape. Yeah. She's flat on the couch. Yeah. She's, she's not doing too well. So last night, normally we go for our Dukes Dice date night and we didn't do that because she wasn't feeling well. So it's just kind of been a, a rougher, rougher week for plays for me. But last Sunday we did do our heavy Sunday over at Empire, uh, before, before they opened. And there were six of us that showed up. The plan was for four of us to play Cuba Libre. I didn't bring my copy. Roy didn't bring his copy. So that kind of <laughs> fell through. This is going to be a theme this week. And Sean forgetting to bring things. Well, I thought I thought he had his copy. Uh-huh. So what wound up happening, there were six of us th- that wound up showing up. Uh, so three of them wound up playing Indonesia, the, the splatter game. And then uh, Jared and I wound up playing Labyrinth, which I talked about a couple months on the show. Labyrinth is a GMT game that's designed by uh, Vocal Runka. And it's kind of a hybrid of Twilight Struggle with his coin games, his counterinsurgency game. Is it based off the movie, which I have seen? No, it is not. It's actually Labyrinth, The War on Terror. So there are different scenarios, but basically it's like post-9-11, and one player is playing the jihadists, the other player is playing as the uh, the Americans. I won't go too much into it, but uh, I don't have many other plays to talk about. But but it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's, It's a really engaging game, lots of history, lots of thematic connections to the mechanics of the game. So basically, I was, I was the jihadist, and as the jihadist, what I'm trying to do is I'm either trying to set off a WMD in the U.S. That, that'll let me win. Okay. Or I'm trying to uh, spread spread out so much that I've created all of these uh, all of these governments that are in in a poor state. Like just just spread discord and spread <laughs> horribleness. Or I can have a couple of really strong um, uh, Islamic states that that have high wealth. And I can win one of those three ways. I did not win at all. In fact, I got I wound up getting wiped from the board in the very last round. Wow. So the Americans can win by wiping you off um, or by having enough uh, wealth in good countries. I had almost won the game about halfway through. It came down to a die roll. I needed to roll a one or a two. I would have won. I didn't. And then it got really bad. It got super bad for me to the point where I got wiped off. But it was a lot of fun. I do enjoy uh, that mix of kind of the, the card-driven play of... Um, of, of Twilight Struggle with the coin coin style play of, uh, of Rumka's other games. So that's Labyrinth from GMT. Uh, if you're interested in kind of a historical card-driven war game, uh, War on Terror, it was good. It was very good. Very nice. I got into play of Great Western Trail, the new Alexander Fister release, hot game. Very hot. Hot game, mainly because it's from a hot designer. You're playing with oven mitts, so hot. No, I did not do that. Oh. Now, I should say, I had been spooked off of this game, having seen a four-player game of this the week before the Dukes of Dice game night. And because of the ghosts. No. Oh. Uh, I'd seen that one last a good, like, way too long, four hours, maybe, and it and it should not last that long. 
And I don't think it typically does last that long. I think there were some circumstances with that game, maybe. I don't know for sure. I wasn't there. I mean, I kind of was there, but I wasn't playing. Anyway, uh, so we got in a three-player one of this. It was uh, our buddy Cameron and Matthew and myself. And, man, this is a really cool game, Sean. Yeah. This is a really cool game. And we're going to be talking about this, I think, within the next couple of weeks uh, to review this one. We did get a review copy in of this. Yes. And, yeah, a lot of fun. I mean, you're going around. It's this hand management component that's really unique about this, where you're trying to keep different types of cattle in hand to ultimately sell to a market and travel further, make your mark. But there's a lot of different ways of scoring in this game. There's there's moving your train up and claiming stations. There's uh, grabbing cows, using cowboys. There's building buildings out on the board. Because as you're going around the board, you're stopping at different places on this trail, and you're kind of going on this loop. And every time you go on this loop, um, the game gets kind of a little bit closer to ending. More things come out as possible hazards or possible things to grab. Really fun. Yeah. Really a lot of fun. And and well done and not too heavy. It, it took a little bit on the expla- explanation. Oh, yeah. There, it's it was very, right on the edge for Very me. rules heavy. Very rules heavy, but but actually reasonably simple to play once you get going. Sure. Once you know the language of the game and the iconography of the game. I enjoyed this one quite a bit. Um, I'm curious to see how it plays at two. I'm curious to see how it plays at four. I don't know if I'll... We'll see if I'll be able to get in both of those. I should be able to. Okay. Uh, it is It is a good amount of fun, though. Yeah. Yeah. So I remember during the rules explanation, because I was kind of back and forth, and you're like, okay, I think I'm ready to play. And Matthew's like, uh, yeah, we're not there yet. Yeah. I was like, no, come on. Let's just let's just go. Yeah, no. no, no yeah, I'm, need... I'm that guy. Yeah. Um, very cool. Yeah. Great Western Trail. Uh, I've enjoyed my, my one two-player game of it, and I'll be getting some more in this week, hopefully. Oh, only two? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah you got to... I talked about it last week. Well, I know. I thought you'd played more than just one game of it. No, so oh. far just the one. There you go. Just, just remember, I, I said in the, my little preamble, it's been a rough week for games, Alex. It's true. Keep up. Come on, man. <laughs> Get on your level. Yes. So uh, I got another play in, though, of the Arkham Horror LCG, which I did talk about last week. Um, also, our buddies over at the Low Player Count podcast, they did a really in-depth talk about it uh, just the other week. And, of course, Rolling Dice and Picking Names did one uh, a couple weeks ago. And this one I played with Matt and Rory. Uh, I did find out that the game that Raquel and I had played, we had created the chaos bag or the the chaos cup, whatever you want to call it, incorrectly. We made it way too hard. We had all of the the modifier tokens for all your skill tests in there, which heavily weight towards negatives, and it was supposed to be much easier. So I think Raquel and I actually could have won our first game had someone set it up correctly. I blame you, Raquel. Actually, no, it's completely my fault. Uh, But anyway, we lost again. We played the same intro scenario. Uh, with three three investigators, I got to play with, I can't remember her name. She's the yellow chick and she's like a librarian. She has these cool tome synergies. So these different books that give you extra actions. And Lisa Simpson? Take, Lisa Simpson, yes. And she had a sax, her saxophone was right. her weapon? Yes. Yes. Ah. <sighs> You said a girl who was yellow, who liked books. I don't know. That, you know me. what? You know what? I, how could I fault you for that? That's that's spot on. That's right. absolutely. Wow, Arkham Horror Simpsons. That sounds that sounds interesting. An interesting crossover. Yeah, I, I would totally watch that, or or play that, depending on what the actual medium was. So anyway, Arkham Horror LCG. I'm very excited to play more of this. I'm very excited for the, some of the deck building. The new expansion packs coming out soon. There's not a whole lot of actual deck construction. And when I say deck building, I mean deck construction. Uh, there's not a whole lot you can do right now because you're pretty limited in what you have. Really, the deck construction comes in uh, as you advance through scenarios, as you gain victory points and complete scenarios, you're able to upgrade your deck. So there's definitely that component of the construction. But as far as the initial construction, there's not a whole lot yet. But I'm excited for this. I'm really enjoying this game. I mean, really, really enjoying it. Very cool. Um, I, I'm curious to see what you're going to think. I think you're going to like it quite a bit. All right. At some enough. point. All right. So that's Arkham Horror LCG again. Sorry, folks. Hopefully more plays next week. I got in a play of Ghost Stories. Ooh. This is the second time I've played this one. I played this one um, uh, with Eugene and with Daniel on our Friday Cardboard Lunch. There's so many different days we have. There's the Dukes of Ice game night. There's the Dukes yeah. of Ice date night. Yep. There's Cardboard Lunch. There's Heavy Sunday. Uh-huh. Uh, too many too many things to keep track of. No, that's what, what are you talking about? That's perfect. Too many things. We need like three more. Uh, so speaking of getting your teeth kicked in, Ghost Stories is a very difficult uh, cooperative one for folks who don't know, where you are trying to keep these various ghosts from taking over the board and haunting spaces and killing your people. It's not good. Don't don't have them kill your people. Uh, involving a lot of dice rolling, moving around, using powers to move other people around. We got our teeth kicked in in this one, Sean, a big time. Big time. Yeah, it's a hard game. It wasn't good. I've only played on the app, but it's hard. It is hard. And uh, when we were not close to winning, we didn't even get the the... The big bad out. We didn't get to that point. We just straight up lost. So 
Uh, but a lot of fun. Yeah, good, good amount of fun even still. It took me a little bit to remember the rules. We were kind of playing as I was trying to remember. So I was not super useful in the early going and it became a little more useful later on, but it eh, didn't matter. We still, we still lost pretty badly. So let's go stories from one of my favorite designers, Antoine Bowser. Well, the last one I'm going to talk about is a new play. Hooray! Hooray! It's one I've played. It's one you've played. Boo! Wait. What? I don't know. Junk Art. Yeah! By Senfu Lim and Jay Cormier. This is from Pretzel Games, and this is a dexterity stacking building game, which is really cool. There's a little gamery element to it. There are these different city cards, and you usually play with three of them, and each one is its own little mini game. You're trying to achieve something different, and the manner in which you're obtaining the pieces is a little bit different. So there was one where there was kind of a trick-taking. Did you play that one? It was Amsterdam? Maybe. It's kind of a trick-taking Possibly. Game where you're playing cards out from hand, and whoever has the highest then gets to pick who gets which piece. Mm. And so the junk art pieces are really weird. So there's some... Uh, there's some like roundish ones that have like a flat edge and there's some, you know, squares and some flat pieces. There's also these weird little like uh, uh, two discs with a little pole in between and lots of weird pieces. And it was really good. It was, yeah. a, it's a really it? solid, uh, you know, stacking game. And I, I really enjoyed it. So, so we played Amsterdam, we played, uh, well, I forget the other ones, but it was just cool to see the different mechanics they use to give you the pieces and to determine the, the scoring criteria. There's a lot of game in that box. Yeah. They use the components really efficiently. Yeah, they absolutely do. So I wound up winning. I got no points in the first round. I got some in the second, and then I wound up winning the third round. And so the final score was uh, me. uh, I had eight, and then our buddy Matt had eight. And the tiebreaker was who scored the most points in the last round, which was me. Kind of a weird tiebreaker. Yeah. Don't you think? I mean, I would think if you'd had some sort of build off. Well, something. It was, but that just seemed, seemed weird to me. Seemed weird that that, that that there's extra value. Like, make sure you do really well in this third round. It's like, well, how am I going to make sure I do that? Interesting incentive. Yeah. Yeah. So it was kind of talking about, you know, tiebreakers and games last week. This was an interesting one. And, you know, Matt was like, oh, that's weird. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of weird. But, uh, but overall, I think junk art was fantastic. I mean, for that, no one had heartburn over it with this, you know, style and weight of game. You know, it's just a fun little dexterity stacking game. So junk art, very cool. Highly recommend it. Um, I'm glad we have access to it over at Empire. A good amount of replayability in, in, in the game modes there too, which I, yeah, I was very appreciative of and, and would like to play more of. Yeah. I'd like to try more of the game modes in there. Very cool. That is what we played this week on to the news. All right, first up, we're talking about three new games, Gen Con 2017 releases, and these are Restoration Games. Yeah, we talked about this new company, Restoration Games, a couple months ago when they first formed up, formed by an attorney, Justin Jacobson, and Rob Davio, and their whole mission statement is to bring older games to update them uh, rules-wise and to give them a new modern you know, finish and, and put them put them out to market. So there are three games that are coming out. One of them is Stop Thief. This was a 1979 family-style deduction game, and it used a, an electronic device with different noises representing the last traces of criminal activity uh, as they were escaping. So this is going to get replaced with, with an app, which is going to be, you know, probably better than an, an old electronic device. So in this game, up to four players are going to use the clues from the app to deduce where the suspect was and hopefully where to find them. So this sounds, uh, this sounds pretty interesting. There's another game called Indulgence. Indulgence is a re-implementation of a game called Dragon Master that came out in 1981. This is a trick-taking game, kind of a, a goofy trick, t- well, not goofy, but... Um, whoa, those wacky popes! <laughs> <laughs> no, it's kind of a crazy trick-taking game, I guess, in terms of me- mechanically. So in Indulgence, you're going to, uh, it's a game of pa- uh, papal intrigue within the Italian Renaissance with play- players using tricks to fulfill variable contracts. I'm a big fan of trick-taking games, so I'm certainly interested in, in hearing it's, about it's this. It's an illusion, Sean. Uh, yes, yeah, an illusion-taking game. And then finally, Downforce, which is a re-implementation of a 1996 game from Wolfgang Kramer. Uh, originally, it was called Top Race. And here, up to six players bid on racing contestants while simultaneously playing cards to manipulate the standings. So it sounds kind of like a Camel Up or a Winter Circle style game, but from Wolfgang Kramer. I'm, I'm interested to hear a little bit more about this. So uh, Kramer's original design had seen many versions with continuously improved rules, and Restoration Games has promised that Downforce will be the best to date with component quality befitting its pedigree. 
So this is kind of interesting. I mean, for for especially for us that we're so cult of the new, um, to bring back these old style games and to but to give them a new polish, I think is uh, is appreciated. I think of a game like um, Escape from Colditz, which has been out on the table a couple times over at Empire, where uh, Osprey Games brought it back, but they said, but we're not really going to update it. We know it's kind of an old design, but we're not going to update it. Um, and from what I've heard, the the age of the game is kind of shown. The, the components are great. It looks it looks great. But they didn't update the rules because they wanted the original game to be intact. And to me, my mind is I would I would have two versions of in there. I would have the original game and then the updated one. But worked for, pretty well for Venos, I thought. Yeah, doing it that way. Sure, sure. So um, interesting, interesting. And I'm I'm excited to see what else Restoration Games has to offer in the future and see what what these releases do. All right. Next up, kind of an interesting one. Uh, cool Mini or not is now a publicly traded company in the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Yeah. Huh. All right. Well, my understanding is that there are different levels of investment or capital needed for different stock exchanges, and so they could more easily meet that threshold in Hong Kong, I suppose, on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Um, so the idea here is that they're not they're not selling off the company. They're still going to have they're still going to retain control over day to day business operations and decisions and things like that. Basically, this is just for an influx of capital, which is going to help them add on more staff, help them expand into new markets. Uh, which they've kind of been doing in in Europe, is my understanding. Uh, so possibly some other markets, and then also acquire new licenses to games, which is uh, which is interesting. So um, I think Simon is really kind of poised to be the company that takes on takes on Asmodee. Could be in an epic epic Titan duel. Whoa! Asmodee versus Simon. Two will enter. And Two then, will probably leave and, and then continue well, to make a lot of money, or one will leave because they've acquired the other one. Oh well, it could be. Yeah. So anyway, that's kind of interesting news. Uh, so best of luck to Simon. Finally, in Kickstarter, Kingdom Death Monster. This is a Kickstarter that just straight up exploded. Sean exploded last when sure I was did. doing the when I was doing the show notes for this. More than seven million dollars already in this Kickstarter. Yeah, crazy. So this is a follow up to uh, the original Kickstarter. It's an update, uh, is is my understanding of Kingdom Death Monster. Right. So here's the description. Kingdom Death Monster is a massive cooperative board game about survival in a nightmare horror world. Survivors fight for their lives against an onslaught of bizarre and fearsome creatures. They will use the fruits of these battles to build a fragile civilization in a place where humans are at the bottom of a monstrous ecology. So Kingdom Death Monster is a really involved game. I know our buddies over at Blue Peg, Pink Peg, well, not, but really it's Rob. Rob is the, the guy that's really big into it over there. Um, our listener, Scott Sexton, I know he is a huge, huge, huge fan of Kingdom Death Monster. This, is a, this game is a commitment. I mean, this is a game where the miniatures are, are awesome. They're fantastic miniatures. They're all in sprues, so you got to clip them out. You got to you got to get the the flash and the molding off. You got to glue them together. Right there, that's that's a big investment. And then there's a huge campaign style game to this as well. So this is, like I said, an investment of of time. I mean, it's an investment of money because you've got um, if you look at the pledge levels, there is a sixty dollar lantern upgrade level, which basically upgrades. It's the update pack to go to lo- to one point five. It's the one point five version. The next level is two hundred bucks, one ninety five, and this gets you the upgrade, gambler's chest, first hero expansion, and then it goes up. There's two fifty, three fifty, seven fifty, um, and that gets you basically all the expansions. I mean, so really, if you if you're gonna do this and you're gonna, you're gonna want everything, seven hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah, how's that? Yeah, no, that's it's it's pretty incredible. Um, like I said, the minis are fantastic. If, um, I don't know from what I've heard about the, I haven't played from what I've heard about the gameplay. It's, it sounds interesting and it sounds fun. Um, but there's no way that I can justify the time investment for this Sure, with, with the podcast. Like there's just, there's just no, no way I could. Um, I'm still clipping all of the, all of the models and putting it together for battle of Prospero with the games workshop game, which is just a, a ton of work too. But it's crazy because I used to do that all the time. Right. Like, I used to just be like, oh, I'm going to put the squad together real quick. Oh, I'm going to paint them real quick. And they're done in a couple of days. And now I'm just like, oh, man, this is crazy. Why aren't these all put together already for me? So um, you've been spoiled. I have been spoiled. You've gotten weak. Yeah. So, I mean, definitely go check this out. If you are into campaign style play, if you are into awesome miniatures, but realizing you have to put them together, 
then this is definitely something you want to you want to check out. But just realize it's a huge time investment. But the demand for it's there. I mean, the demand for it was there before the Kickstarter because because there were no copies of it available. So it's cool that they're at least doing this. Um, ton of stretch goals. Ton of ton ton of stuff. I know Jared has it or Jared uh, backed it. Um, I I don't know what level he did, but I have my suspicions. And uh, so at least we'll be able to get a get a feel for it when it comes out. Um, but yeah, so go go check it out. Uh, when does it send, Alex? Uh, it ends early January, January 7th, 2017. The distant future. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, that's going to do it for the news. Let's head on to our review. Has this ever happened to you? Oh no, not again. My steel's with my titanium, my titanium's with my steel, my heat's all over the place. I don't know how much money I have. This is just awful. There are cubes everywhere. How will I ever solve this terrible problem? Well, don't worry, Alex. There is a better way to play Terraforming Mars. Thanks to the fine folks over at Meeple Realty, you can play Terraforming Mars and stop worrying about knocking your player pieces all over the place. With their new terraforming colony insert, you have your choice of wooden or plexiglass overlays to keep those roving cubes in place. In addition to these vital overlays, the insert has special holders for the hex tiles and other components, plus custom markers for the temperature and oxygen levels. And you can even use their Meeple Realty Rover as an enhanced first player marker. The terraforming colony insert plus all their other amazing inserts are available now at MeepleRealty.com. Meeple Realty, think inside the box. Fee, fi, fo, fum. I smell the blood of a game review. It's blood of an Englishman. Is that really your giant voice? No, no. But that's what I came up with in the moment. It was like a... Let me try, I'm going to workshop some things. Okay. Fee, fi, fo, fum. Is that better? Yeah, that's a little bit better. Okay, let me hear I yours. Mean... What's your giant voice? <clears throat> Fee, fly, fo, fum. Yeah, that's better. All right. Yeah. Yay, I yeah. win the voice off. No, I'm not even going to, yeah, I'm not going to even go there. That was, that was solid. Okay. I, I have a better Arnold Schwarzenegger. How, yeah, how about giant Arnold let me Schwarzenegger? Hear, let me, wait, wait, let me hear your friendly Shogath. Ooh, hello, friends. I'm the friendly Shogoth. No, no, okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't that one. I don't know. Yeah, no, that wasn't that, hey, wasn't that good. Hey, let's talk about Blood of an Englishman. <laughs> oh, okay, the game we're reviewing. Yes, okay. So Blood of an Englishman is a two-player asymmetric card game that has the players taking on the roles of Jack and the Giant from the Jack and the Beanstalk fairy tale. The game's designed by Dan Kassar, designer of one of the Dutchie favorites, Arboretum, and it features beautiful art by Chris Ostrowski, who also did some of the art, in, well, he did the art in another Renegade game, Lotus. And we should also note here that this was a review copy from Renegade Game Studios. So the game consists of 50 cards, four sets of Beansock cards valued one through nine, two sets of separate Fee, Fi, Fo, and Fum cards. Now you gotta do that in the voice. Oh, wait, Fee, no. Fi, Fo, Fum, she... And then two sets of three treasures. So two, two geese or two gooses, uh, two, two gold cards, and then two harps. And at the start of the game, you're going to arrange the cards in five columns of 10 cards each. So now one player, like I said, is going to be Jack. And Jack's goal is to collect three different of the treasure cards. So they need one, one goose, one gold, one harp. And Jack does this by assembling three separate beanstalks, one at a time, that need to be in ascending order of six cards. They don't necessarily need to be in uh, uh, symmetric, not symmetrical. They don't need to be sequential. So I can have like one, three, four, seven, eight, nine as my six cards, and then I can collect one of the treasure cards. Boom! I'm a third of the way to victory. Now, if I'm the giant, I'm trying to kill Jack, obviously. So I can do that in a couple different ways. If I can assemble four of the fee fi fo fum cards so that they're all in one column uh, in any order, but, but, clumped. but, but clumped together, I win. Or if the fee fi fo fum cards are arranged along the bottom in a row, um, we're not necessarily in a row, but just on they the bottom, connected, the bottom of the stacks. Yeah, four of the five stacks. Four of the five stacks, then I'll win that way. Or if I make it so that Jack just simply cannot get a beanstalk card uh, or cannot complete a beanstalk, rather, then I would win. So here's how the game works. So Jack will go first, and Jack is able to take three actions. So Jack can move a card from a front of a stack to the front of a different stack, from the back of a stack to the front of that same stack, or from the front 
of a stack or the back of a stack to his beanstalk. So for example, maybe there's a, a nice two beanstalk card that I want, but it's underneath a nine. So what I can do is I can take that nine and I can move it to a different stack. Then I can take the two and add to my, bean, my beanstalk. And then maybe there's a three buried at the back of a stack, which I'm now gonna take and add to my beanstalk. So that's what Jack's doing. Now, the giant only has one move because the giant is big and slow and ponderous, but it's a big move, which makes sense for, for the giant. So the giant can do one of three things then. He can either move exactly four cards from the front of one stack to the front of another stack, or he can move two cards front to front, which is a nice little re rearrangement. Or finally, the giant can just remove any single beanstalk card from any of the stacks where, wherever it happens to be which is really neat because it kind of, it's constraining what Jack is able to do. So you're gonna continue this until one of those win conditions is met, and that's how you play Blood of Englishman. Yeah, pretty simple rule set. Pretty simple rule set, and I think that just hearing the rules isn't enough to fully appreciate the interestingness of the gameplay. Yes. Because um, it's like, okay, so I just move cards around and I try and collect some, eh, it seems, it seems pretty simple, and it is. Rules-wise, it's a very a very simple game, but I think there's a lot of interesting tactical depth here. There's a, there's a nice dual um, element that's that's involved. Let's talk about the rulebook. I mean, it's it's a simple rule set, uh, and the rulebook does a very good job of, of, of getting those rules across. I didn't really have any trouble. Plus, there are some great player aid cards that outline everything, and it's really all, all you need at that point. I, so I think the, the rules are very simple, but, but well, well expressed in the rulebook. Yes, indeed. So, art components. Uh, one quibble slash nitpick here. Okay. I would like to see a smaller box for all of this. I mean, if you look at, say, Oh My Goods, uh, the size of that box, or you look at, um, say, a For Sale, or even a, a great a Deep Sea Adventure, or something like that, I think this could easily fit in a, in a smaller box. Oh My Goods has a lot more cards and is a lot smaller of a box. This, this, this has 54 cards, 50 cards for the game itself, and then four reference cards. This, is a, this would be a perfect travel size game, I think, if it, were, if it were packaged as such. You could really just have a, a tuck box or something like that, that that would fit this pretty well. So I'd prefer to see a smaller box, but that's just me. So let me ask you a couple things. Sure. Number one, oh my goods. Yeah. If I sleeve these, are they gonna fit in this box? Uh, doubtful. No, the answer is no, Alex. Sure. If I sleeve Blood of an Englishman, are they going to fit in the box? Mm, probably. Yes, the if answer. You, if you take out the insert. <laughs> yes, the answer. <laughs> so, the, so I mean, one thing you're discounting though is is shelf space and mm -hmm. and. I don't. And how, I don't know what the retail considerations are, but yeah. just for my I own mean, purposes, as I like to have games in boxes when I'm traveling with them. Right. I'd prefer to have a smaller box for this okay. to go in. Why don't you do what Suzanne does and just put a bunch of games in like one deck I'm box? I'm way, way, way too lazy for that. And you're not on Suzanne's way, level. Way, way, way too lazy. Not on Suzanne's level at all as far as that goes. So yeah, this is pretty consistent with a bunch of different card game box sizes like this. Like this is the same size as Yeah, as it's a Chimera broader. Right. It's a broader and, thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, yeah. Okay. All right. Anyway, quibble on. Get off my back. That's my. That's my only quibble. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. That's All it. All right. Well. Um. Yeah. I think the card quality is good. I. I have no problems with the box size. Okay. <laughs> For the guy that doesn't even buy games, I absolutely buy games. So, so this is taking up no imaginary space in your imaginary game collection. <laughs> <laughs> at my moment, at the moment, it is not taking up any space in my collection. So, what, what do you think of Chris Ostrowski's art here? I think it works great. I, I think it fits the the mood of the game. It's sort of this. Um, I, I like how the beanstalk cards, uh, the art changes on them as they go higher and higher uh -huh. up into the sky. I, I think that's a nice touch. I, and yeah, I, I don't have any issues with, with that piece of things at all. One thing that I had, I had noted was that Chris's art in Lotus is kind of his take on light because it's very bright, very, uh, like luminescent, almost looking yeah, gorgeous cards. game here. There's a lot of darkness and I like, I like how he kind of uses, uses the darkness um, how it, it's, you know, the light sources are, it's like the sun, but it's through a bunch of, a bunch of the, the beanstalk. So you can't right. quite see it or the treasure is illuminated by candles in the background, things like that. So yeah, I really, I really think the art's fantastic. Um, I, I think it looks, I think it looks really good. The downside is just simply that you're kind of splaying the cards and columns. Right. So you're not necessarily getting the full feel of the art all the time, but I mean, just going, just thumbing through the deck, it's, it's, it's really beautiful. So I think, I think Chris does a great job there. No, definitely solid. Yeah. Good looking game. All right, so uh, so gameplay. Um, so like we were kind of saying before, this is a pretty simple rule set, and just hearing the rules, you're like, okay, so I move a couple cards here, I collect some cards here, I'm the giant, I'm trying to set this up. To me, that doesn't really convey 
the the duel of the game and the the very the very careful way that you have to achieve your goal while still playing defense and keeping the other side from from achieving their goal. What what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I like that. And both sides definitely feel very different. Jack oh, yeah. definitely has that feel of being nimble and, ah, oh, this card now goes here and this one goes here and now I grab this one and and sort of that, that almost desperation of trying to move quickly and get away from the giant. The giant has this just, every move is just a boom yeah. kind of move. and Because it, it's only one versus three. Sure. But in but there's so many more ways for the giant to win and to, to capture victory. That feels okay. And it, and it feels balanced. The rules feel, I think, to a degree, balanced. You have to know how to play. Yes. I think this is one where immediately you're not going to get a sense of things. For instance, a lot of players, you get three options as the giant. But really, for most of the game, you should probably only be doing two of those. So the three options, as Sean mentioned during the rules, move four cards at once. Yeah, you should be doing that one quite a bit. Remove a card from the game. Yeah, you should be doing that one quite a bit, too. you got to make it try and make it impossible or put some pressure on Jack to find different cards. Move two cards individually front to front. Unless you're doing that to win the game, you probably should be avoiding that because guess what Jack can do on his turn? Undo your entire move. Well, sure. And then get an extra move on top of it. Yes. But at the same time, and this is one of the things too, is I'm happy if I can, I can make Jack take an entire turn to get one card. But you haven't made any progress as the giant. Except that the more time, the more time that goes on, the harder it becomes for Jack. Sort of. But if the game state's saying the same, other than a card getting added to the Jack's beanstalk, Jack's making progress and you probably aren't. So, I, I yeah, and actually it references that in the rule books. It references, hey, just so you know, Jack can totally undo your stuff and maybe you might want to wait on this one unless there's a situation where you think Jack wouldn't care to undo what you just did. Right. Which is certainly possible, but I've seen enough plays, like I played this one uh, with our buddy Eugene uh, the other day, and he would make, you know, his giant move and then I would undo it and then add a card. Mm-hmm. And I did that three turn, like three or four turns in a row. Right. Where that just kept happening before he was like, oh, you have to kind of shuffle stacks and move stacks better. I agree exactly what you're saying. What I'm saying, though, is that even as the game progresses, though, with the giant doing nothing, as the game progresses, the choices for Jack get constricted more and more because there are less cards to dilute the FIFA Fo Fum cards. There are less card beanstalk cards for Jack to choose from. Sure. And so, but even just delaying Jack can, can be fine. I would disagree with that if only because there's no actual timer and you as the giant are not actually affecting the game state. You're basically letting Jack just get a free move to poach a card Mm -hmm. and poach a card and poach a card. Yes, the giant does get more powerful as the game goes on, but if you as the giant aren't removing cards or moving stuff around, you're not actually making progress towards your goals. You're just letting the game kind of naturally advance. But what what, what I, the only reason I'm saying this is because sometimes that still may just be the best move. It may not, there may not be a better move to just move four cards. There may not be a better and that, that's what you I'm could saying. Be right. Yeah, could, it's not it's not a bad move. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, if I think if you're doing it too many turns, I think Jack is gonna is gonna wipe the floor with you. Oh yeah, because there's a there, there's an incremental advantage there that Jack's getting that basically extra action, and that's worth more than the the level of constriction that's placed on Jack. Correct. But yeah, I found this to be a really cool, interesting puzzle, and having to advance my agenda while being on defense, and sometimes you're playing super defense. And sometimes you're being super offensive. Right. And it just, it really just depends. And I like knowing that you have to transition from one moment to the next as something really cool. And I found this to be really enjoyable and full of a lot of really difficult decisions. Yes. And really like, it remind, it reminded me of Arboretum. So Arboretum is kind of a rummy style game where you're, uh, you know, you're, you're drawing a card, you're playing a card, and then you're discarding a card, Right. And that agonizing decision of which card do I discard, it's so agonizing. And I feel like there's a lot of agonizing decisions in this game. But of course, I mean that in a, in a good way. Yes. Um, because Interesting decisions. Right. So you're saying to yourself, okay, well, as the giant, man, if I do this, I can really set myself up for a fee fi fum in the next turn or two. And what that means is Jack either needs to stop what he's doing and deal with this or continue on and possibly lose the game. But... By doing this, I'm going to allow Jack to set himself up to get this goose card that he's going to need. And so it, I, I just really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed those decisions in this game. And it is an evolving game in the sense that Jack looks pretty powerful early game a lot of times. Because Jack is just moseying around. Oh, I need this treasure. I need this one. Oh, i got plenty of options. No problem. But as the game goes on, it gets tougher and tougher. And there's fewer fewer outs for Jack to find. Right. And I think that's an interesting piece of this, too. And I think that's my most enjoyable way to win. I've only won that this way once where Jack ha- as the giant where Jack has no viable options. Mm. Um, I've only, like I said, I've only done it once, 
but I, I seem to enjoy that one the most for, for whatever reason. I enjoy doing like these early, like oh, I'm going to remove this card and I'm just going to remove this card while Jack's like, oh, here's my first beanstalk. I'm well on my way to, to my second beanstalk. And then we get to a point where Jack took one card value too high. Yeah. And now, boom, I take this card. You now have nothing. Yeah. Only happened once. And it's, I think it's probably the more difficult to pull off. It's a turtle win. Yeah. There you go. For Motani, for those that don't know what we're talking about or don't care. Yeah. That's uh, uh, deep, deep cuts. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I, I think that this is a very enjoyable filler. What's, what's the game time on this? About 15 minutes? It depends, it depends on how good the person you're playing against is. Okay. If the person you're playing against doesn't know what they're doing, it could be a very quick game. On average, assuming... Yeah, prob- assuming, probably about 15. Yeah, about and 15. Quick, and fairly quick setup time, by the way. Oh, yeah. Shuffle, 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 deal out five piles of 10. Yep. Splay them, you're good. Um, Theme-wise, do you find this to be a thematic game? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the giant feels like this big hulking thing that's like grabbing chunks of vine out of out of midair and and is moving, like taking a big stomp of cards and just rah, grabbing this and it, this goes over here. And, right. Uh, and Jack feels like this nimble guy trying to dodge all of this. Trying to climb up the beanstalk to grab one of those treasures. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's very thematic. More thematic than it probably deserves to be for this for this kind of game. Yeah. For this, you know, this single deck of cards. It it there's just such a connection between the mechanics and the theme. Um, it's really it's really good. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Sean, your final thoughts on this? Yeah, I find this to be very enjoyable. I find this to be um, another game by Dan Kassar that that I enjoy greatly. This is a two player dual game that I'm. It's going to be at the forefront of my mind to pull out because it's such a quick teach. Because it's so simple. That first game against a new player. More than likely, I'm probably going to clean their clock just because they're not quite aware of everything. But I think after that first play, there'll be something that clicks, and then they're off to the races. to The race to climb a beanstalk or to destroy the beanstalk. Simple rule set, good amount of depth here. Yeah, I'd agree with you there, Sean. Uh, so what, what, what does that amount to on the Ducal scale? Okay, so we have a six-point scale. A one is poorly designed but playable, not necessarily fun. It's not going to be anywhere close for this game. A six is an all-time favorite that's a contender for the top ten. It's going to be a five. But I guess I'm trying to decide if it's going to be a five or a filler five. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? How we kind of give that, that like... Okay. Uh, that modifier. Interesting. Um, so a five is a great game. We'll rarely turn down a play of it. Um, so I'm going to call it a filler five. So, I mean, when I'm thinking of a filler game, when I'm thinking of a two-player duel game... Um, it's, it's definitely going to be, at the, like I said, it's going to be at the forefront of my mind because it is, it is such a solid game. Um, I mean, a game that I, that I, that I love that is a six, like Seven Wonders Duel, um, this is a much easier teach than that. So given, given time constraints, given, you know, level of play or whatever, I'm, I might be more likely to bring this out. And I really did enjoy it. I really, I really like this puzzle here. Um, so I think Dan just did a great job on, on the design. I think the, the art is fantastic. And so overall, I just think it's, it's a very solid game. So I'm going to give it, but I'm going to give it that, that filler modifier. Okay. Uh, so filler five, a great game will, will rarely turn down a play of it. I, I'm with you on, on the score for sure. I'm, I'm there at a five okay. with this one. A great game will really, rarely turn down a play of it. Maybe just a little bit lower than you, just a little bit, just a shade. Uh, not because of the box, <laughs> just a shade lower. Uh, but I, but I, I do really enjoy this one. I agree with you. It feels thematic. It feels connected to that theme yes, really well. And as I mentioned, simple simple rule set, but a good amount of depth here. The rules feel different. It's an easier teach than something like Raptor, which has sort of oh, an asymmetric yeah. dual component. And Raptor is really enjoyable and sure. really thematic and a lot of fun. I actually like these asymmetric dueling games. Yes, absolutely. Pretty cool. Uh, and if you compare it to Arboretum, I, at least to me, I got this one a lot more easily than. Oh Arboretum. yeah, oh yeah. At which, yeah, kind of a weird comparison anyway. But I, I, I like the design of this one. I like, I like elegant games with simple rules with a lot of depth. It fits perfectly. So I like Blood of an Englishman. It's one I, I may actually pick up a copy of myself. Cool. As a result of uh, just having played it. Hey, and those of you out there listening, you can pick up a copy too. For free, courtesy of Renegade Games. Hooray! They've agreed to do a little uh, do a little giveaway of Blood of an Englishman, which, by the way, I always uh, reminds me of uh, Son of a Preacher Man for some reason. Okay. Anyway, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so what we're going to do uh, when this episode drops is we're going to have a Facebook entry, a Twitter entry, and then if you want to have a third way to enter this random drawing, you can record your best giant fee fi fo fum voice. Or I guess if you want to do a friendly Shoggoth fee fi fo fum, either one is acceptable. Yeah, that'll that'll work. Yeah, either any, one. Really, any fee fi fo fum recorded that's you. Yeah, will count as what? Three entries. Three entries. Three Holy entries. Ca- that's a good amount of work. Wow. Let's call it. Let's call it two. Okay. Fine. 
two entries. You two. talked me down. Okay, so four. I look, look, guys. I tried to get you three entries, but <laughs> but mean old Sean over there just wanted to give you two. Well, I want people to go to the Facebook page. I want people uh, to go to the okay. Twitter. Right. So I'll put up a, a Twitter post up, and you can retweet that for an entry. Facebook, you can share it for an entry, and then also uh, mention a friend in the comments. It'll be all. I'll be there. Um, and then yes, yeah, send us your fee five fo fum in a voice of your choosing, uh, and you can uh, you can send that to Sean at Dukes of Dice dot com. Yeah, Sean at Dukes of Dice dot com. There you go. Yep. Yeah. With a subject line fee five fo fum. Yeah. So the, so a couple little fine print. This is open to continental U.S. only, but this is going to run a, a little bit less than two weeks when the episode drops. Uh, December twenty third at midnight is the deadline to get those to us. Very good. So and, and we'll play some of those some of those fee five fo fums on the show. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. So thanks again to Renegade Games for uh, for that and also for the review copy, which we do appreciate. All right. Well, that's going to do it for our review of. Blood of an Englishman from Renegade Game Studios and Dan Kassar. Two fives from the Dukes. Pretty pretty solid game. We're going to head over to another review. Bonus review! Woo! All right. So second review. Yeah. We're talking about uh, the Essen hotness in this case. It is... Capital Lux. Yes, indeed. From Aporta Games and Pixie Games. Why are you holding up the box and showing it to me like I don't know what you're talking about? Sean, look at this box. Oh, look at that. Look at this box. It is designed, and I'm going to absolutely butcher this one, Sean. Absolutely butcher this. The review, you mean? Well, maybe. Probably that, too. (laughs) Uh, Aleph Svensson and Christian A. Ostby. Ostby? Ostby. I may have screwed that up royally, but that's the best I got, Sean. Yeah. So they designed Capital Lux. Artwork is done by Quanchai Moria. Oh, boy. Which, and it is well done. It is very well done. This is a very retro... So the art is one of the things the most striking to me about this game. It's um, it's a very retro-looking art style, kind of like the, like the 1920s, 1930s, like sci-fi, like ray gun type thing. So Capital Lux is a card game for two to four players where you are trying to build the most impressive home city that is still not quite as good as the capital, because then you're going to offend you're going to offend the capital. Think uh, think of uh, Hunger Games. Yeah, but but don't don't think of Hunger Games. So in this game, what you're going to do is you're going to get five or six cards depending on the player count, and then you're going to do a, a draft, two cards at a time. And there are four different suits, basically four of these uh, different roles. What do they call those? Alex? Are profession cards? Sorry, Sean? professions. Excuse me. Uh, there is the agent, the blue card. Mm-hmm. There is the cleric, who's uh, the kind of pinkish purplish yeah. card. There's the scholar, who's the green card. And there's the merchant, who's the yellow card. So once you complete the draft of each round, and there are three rounds of this game, by the way, then you're going to take turns playing one of the cards from your hand, either to your hometown or to the capital. Now, if you play it to your hometown, nothing else happens. You just play it down there, and you may or may not be scoring some points for it at the end of the game and possibly qualifying for an end round bonus with it. Now, if you play the card to the capital, you're going to get some sort of extra action. So what happens if you play the the first one, Alex? So if you play the agent card, you're going to go through a deck of four different modifiers. There's a minus one, a minus three, a plus two, a plus four, and you'll be able to assign those to one of the four stacks. One of the four professions, right? Correct. Okay, what's what's the next roll? Uh, you have the cleric. The cleric lets you poach a card from one of the other three stacks, the lowest valued one, and add it in front of you. you yeah. Steal from the hometown. So you're moving from capital to your hometown. Scholar lets you draw an extra card from the deck. An extra profession card, yeah. Yep. And the merchant gets you a disc. A gold disc. And I'm, and I'm doing like finger air quotes with disc because it's referenced as discs in the rule book. There's the ca- circles. On the cards, they're shown as circles. But then when you actually open up the game, it's these uh, butter pats. They're, they're <laughs> kind of these square square little deals, square yeah. wooden things. It's a little little weird, a little weird. It is, it is the weirdest thing. And those are uh, either points at the end of the game, or you can use them to modify uh, your score for end round bonuses, which we'll, we'll talk about in a second here. So once everyone's played out all of their cards, either to their hometown or to the capital, what you're going to do is you're going to compare uh, everyone's value of a certain profession type to that value in the capital. So let's say that there are two cleric cards. There's a two and a four. So the value there is six. In order for me uh, to not get my cleric cards wiped, I need to be at six or less. So let's say that, Alex, you have a three and a four. You're going to lose all your cleric cards. Yep. Because you are over that threshold. You have you have flown too close to the sun and you've the, the capital has come in and they've 
They've wiped you out. Because, Listen, buddy. But let's say instead that you were at seven and the capital was at six and you had one of those butter patties. You can then <laughs> spend that to basically reduce your, your value to kind of get under that threshold or meet that threshold, so to speak. Now, let's say that, that aside, let's say that I do happen to have a three and a three and I'm right there at the threshold. I'm going to uh, then compare that to everyone else as everyone, everyone else who's under that threshold. Maybe uh, Raquel has, has a five value. So she doesn't get her cards wiped, but because I have the highest value at, at or under that threshold, I'm going to get a bonus card from the capital, which I'm going to put to the side and score at the end of the game. So you do this for all the professions. You then go to the next round. You draft, play cards, check the scores. Uh, get the bonus cards, et cetera. And then at the end of the game, you're going to add up all the bonus card point values. So if it's a, if it's a four, it's a five, six is the highest. They all go from, they're, they're ones? No, it's twos, right? Two is the, the least? Two is the smallest. Two is the smallest. Uh, so two to six. And then uh, I'm going to add up all of the values in my hometown and whoever ha- uh, plus any butter patties left over. And whoever has the most points is the winner of Capital Lux. That's how you play. Might be a little confusing, um, just kind of from the rules and without seeing everything out in front of you. But uh, yeah, so the rule book, I, for a, a slightly more complex than, say, Blood of an Englishman or Son of a Preacherman, uh, this rule set is is expressed itself pretty well in, in the rule book. Do you have a chance to look at the rule book other than, other than you're doing now? Not really. Okay. Yeah, didn't need to. <laughs> All right. But does it look, I mean, it looks fine. It's a fine rule book. Sure. Okay. Yes. Just fantastic. I've. I've looked through it thoroughly and can make an accurate assessment that this is a rule book. Yes. Yes. All right. So um, as far as the artwork, are you a fan of Quan Chi Moria's art here? Oh, it's stunning. Oh, yeah. It's it's awesome. The box looks great. The cards look great. It, it all looks great. Yeah. Yeah. The art is, is awesome. So, yeah, the art's fantastic. Um, the card quality is really, really solid. It's the iconography is really clear. I mean, really, or not iconography, but the, the graphic design is really clear. It's yes. easy to look across the table, see what everyone else has, because that's what you're constantly doing. You're constantly adding up. They have seven points. Okay, well, I only have six. What do I need to do? I need to steal a card here, whatever. Um, the component choice, like we talked about these these butter tabs, is a little weird. My guess, and this is complete conjecture, my guess is they said, hey, I know you wanted these, the manufacturer said, hey, I know you wanted these round yellow discs. Just so you know, we have uh, an overstock of these of these square ones, and we'll give you a deal on them. And they said, oh, okay, reduces our per unit price by 30 cents. Sure, let's do it. I don't know, just conjecture. Huh. I mean, it's kind of it's, yeah, yeah, it's kind of weird. It's as good a reason as any. Or maybe maybe it was designed by folks who were blind. Um, okay. Well, because what I would normally expect- No, that wouldn't explain that at all. No, I don't know what you're talking about. Nope, that doesn't when work. When I see- these gold discs on the cards. What I'm thinking are what I'm thinking of are these kind of um, those half inch discs that you you see in a lot of Euro games. You know, for for score markers or for for what, whatever. These are much bigger. These are what about inch and a half across? Yeah, they're solidly I mean, sized. They're yeah. You're not you're not missing them across the table. So as as much as there's a disconnect there between the art and what the rules describe as a disc, um, it's still. There's still some value there, I think, because because they are so big. But it just it was weird. I mean, really, if if uh, if they had just shown the the square discs on the cards, I don't think this would we'd even be talking about this. I think you could even have like a small coin, even at like a cardboard chit, it would have been fine. Yeah, like it it just doesn't necessarily even need to be wood here. Maybe it doesn't need to be. It's certainly not bad that it is. But I think I think having I mean, it's probably they probably priced it out and having a punch board for the cardboard chits. Yeah. It was probably more expensive. Could be. So. Could be. Could have done a smaller box. Oh I'm just boy. all about small boxes today. I, 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 yeah. Is this... <laughs> Not with the size of these components, by the way. And it's even bigger. It's bigger than Blood of an Englishman. Oh, yeah, it sure is. There, there are more cards uh, in this game than Blood of an Englishman. And and you do have the, the butter pats that, yep. that take up a good chunk of space. Sure. In there. But if, if you had tr- Capital Lux Travel Edition, uh, you wouldn't necessarily need that. And again, this is another one that... Tricky to set up on a tray table because, yeah, it just doesn't, it just wouldn't work. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about gameplay here. I, what I really enjoy about this is the tension between, am I able to play this to my city, my hometown for points and do nothing else? Or or do I want to be involved in some kind of manipulation by playing to the capital and getting an extra action? And do I even need to do that? Or do I, do I specifically really need to play to the capital because I'm way over the threshold? Right. That's a difficult decision. And knowing that, well, you still have two cards in hand, what are you going to play? Are you going to play some of your capital? Are you going to play a cleric who's going to nab one of the cards that I need 
like right now, maybe I'm over the threshold, but if you grab this green two, I'm now going to be over the threshold and I'm going to lose my entire stack of green cards. There are some tough decisions to make here and some interesting um, competing things that you're trying to do with, even within yourself. Well, and not to mention, since you can draw extra cards, but not everyone's necessarily going to draw extra cards, basically based on the draft. I mean, you, you right. some people are going to end up with fewer green cards and some people aren't even going to use those green cards to draw cards with. Right. You might end up in a situation where, and this isn't a case where lack of actions, everyone, it's not everyone that gets the same number of actions, but it's, it's there's there's not an, an, uh, an imbalance there. But if you have extra cards in hand, they just immediately get dumped. Right. So when the last player plays a card from hand, everyone else gets one extra round of actual card play. And let's say I have two cards left over in hand after that card play. I have to, I have to play them to my hometown, which can be devastating if you haven't prepared correctly. Yes. Because maybe you're like, oh, I was really planning on playing this card out for an action. And now it's going to put me way over the threshold. In fact, we tried a two player game and the first round that happened to me. And I was like, oh boy, I completely screwed that up. Yep. So, yeah, and it it kind of has that feel in some ways. And you're gonna you're gonna give me the evil eye for this one. I know, <laughs> not of splendor. Okay, everything is not splendor. It's um in this one specific way, Sean. Okay. I'm, I want to be clear. I'm narrow uh -huh. narrowly saying this to baseball highlights. In that you have a limited number of options in hand, and okay. the order in which you play them, the timing of which you sure. play them, and as you bleed down your hand, you have fewer and fewer options, okay. and you might put back yourself into a corner. All right. I don't have any more pink cars I can add to my hometown to beat you or or get myself under the threshold. I don't have any more cards to draw more cards. I'm stuck with these two. I don't have anything more to, to add the modifiers that I might need. Uh, so you can bleed down options reasonably quickly in this one. Uh, which can put yourself in a bind. So there's there's definitely a balancing act you have to do with this one, for sure. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give that to you. I'll allow it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, anyway, after that long explanation, yeah, I, I I like that tension, too. And I like that tension of, of it's not press your luck, because there's not an element of, I mean, there's the card draws are luck, I guess. But there's not an element of of that so much in this game. Certainly there are some, some things that are random elements within the game. But it's not. It's it's trying to get as close as you can to the edge. It's it's like almost playing ch a game of chicken. I guess is the better way of saying it. You're okay. trying to get as close as you can without getting hit by the train. Right. Right. That's the idea, and I like that feeling in this game. Well, and on top of it too, I mean, there are the modifiers. So if you play the blue spy, secret or agent, information. Yeah. Right. So you're either you're adding to adding to or subtracting to the value of the rolls in the capital. So I draw this this you know plus four card. And I know that I'm going to put it on maybe the cleric because, or the cleric only has three points. But now I know it's going to be a seven, assuming nothing else changes. So I can use that to my advantage, right? Um, but then someone else plays another modifier somewhere else. I know it's not the positive four because there's only the four options. But I don't know if it's negative. Is it positive? Um, so there's just a lot of ways to very subtly manipulate what's going on. You have that manipulation in terms of the modifiers. You have it in terms of drawing an extra card, which is which can be you know crippling potentially, or or win you the game. You have the option of uh, of the cleric basically nabbing a card from somewhere else, changing that threshold amount, and then you have the option of um, getting the gold tabs, playing the gold card to potentially you know hedge your bets and and modify your your uh, your actual value on a given card, a uh, given profession. So there's just so many decisions to make in this game for a game that is on its surface deceptively simple. Play some cards out, stay under this number, and get some bonus points. Yeah, this is one of those I didn't get until like the second – you play three yes. rounds in this. I didn't get until the second round of the game. Oh, that's why you don't just play out stuff for actions. You need to play stuff in front of you for points. Right. Like a lot of points. Right. And so we've played at all levels, uh, uh, two-player, three-player, four-player. Two-player I wasn't particularly enthused about. Um, it – was okay, wasn't wasn't great. I probably won't think to play this at two players. I like it quite a bit at three and four. I think I just slightly like three players better, but not enough where I, I mean, I'm, I'm still very happy to play this at four. It feels like a different game at four. A little more chaotic. That, yeah, you have that situation where people definitely will have more cards than other people, for right. sure. Uh, so that's going to be a consideration. Uh, the board state changes so much, there's a lot more you don't know. Uh, three, you feel like there's a little bit more control, but even then there's still trying to fight and duel with other people and trying to keep your eye and, and stay as close as you can. Two, you just have to be better than the other guy. Yeah. So it, and, and it's not as tight at two as a result of that, I don't think. Any, any thoughts on the theme? Is this a thematic game to you? No. 
No, okay. not one bit. Yeah. So, I mean, I, th- I think about this and I, I like the spy, right? Because the spy is giving you potentially more, more information and changing the value of something. Um, the cleric makes a lot of sense. You're going out, you're kind of converting someone to your cause, right? Sure. What's the green card again? Green card is let you... Uh, no, but what's the... the scholar. Role? The scholar. So the, so the scholar gives you another profession card. So Via makes, human trafficking sh- and all sorts of other shenanigans. Sure. And then, was it the engineer? No, the merchant. The merchant? See, but here's, here's the thing. The fact that it's that hard to like connect a role name yeah. to what you're actually doing in this game... No, it's it. No, okay. There, there is no theme here, and it's fine. There's some theme. There's not a theme. Okay, there's some theme. There's, there's it's, a theme. There may be a theme. It is completely disconnected from from the game. Well, I like the I like this idea that you don't want to be more impressive than the capital. Sure. I I think that's I think that's cool, and that's what that's that's it, what that's it, doing. It's an awesome mechanic. Right, but that's but that's the theme behind it. Is but you, are they people or are they buildings? Are, are, are you impressing the capital with the people? Like, oh, this person's a six person. He's much cooler than this guy. Well, or is it representing a building itself? I mean, people are people of value, Alex. Sure. I'm giving this a little more credit for theme than you are, it sounds N- like. Not one bit of credit. Yeah. And the fact that you <laughs> and, and the fact that you don't know, like it's sorry, it doesn't it does not connect. It does not connect to me. Okay. So none of the things that I said where I linked <laughs> The mechanic to the role of the card. Here's the thing. If you're going to be talking about being more impressive than the capital city, are they people or are they buildings? They're people. Are they influence per- within a guild yeah. of some kind? Yeah. yeah, that's what they are. Okay. And then by having them move to your town versus, no, your sorry. Your cleric has said, hey, come come benefit, here, come over here, we're, I'm convincing you. But you sent them to the capital city, whereas opposed to if you leave them in your hometown, then they just, it doesn't, it does, it falls apart. Uh, does it? It totally falls apart. You choose where to send the people. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Hometown I'm, or there. But let's say, okay, so you send the cleric out there. Yeah. And he does his clericy thing and, and yeah. brings someone back. He's a missionary. He's uh, going out. He's, then what happens if you just leave him at home? He he's, doesn't. He's, he, he's not proselytizing out in the capital. Right. Okay. You only get actions if you. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but it it, eh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for me. Okay. You, I, you seem to disagree and think it's a really thematic game. I guess. no, I don't think it's really thematic, but I think but I think there are thematic connections between the the roles and the mechanics that they do when you get the action, and also this I like this idea of you want to be the best hometown, but not be more impressive than the capital. I like that core idea here, okay. <laughs> but in terms of how the actions themselves and, and the play of it connects to that, okay, I just don't think that's there. Uh, so, for instance, you're saying, all right, I'm playing a blue card, or I'm playing a green card, or I'm playing this, and it does that. You're, you're now that even now that you know the names, mm-hmm. I think in playing this you're going to be unlikely to say them. And I think to me that indicates a game that that doesn't succeed on theme. Now to be clear, you're talking about narrative. You're talking about the narrative of it. I'm just talking about connection between mechanics and and what and the, the story card, of the game and what the card purports to do. Yeah, I still don't see it. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll agree that you're wrong. Oh, oh <laughs> that wouldn't be us. What? Yeah. Uh, no, we're we're not doing that. I will tell you this. It's another one of those where I just straight up don't care. Okay. It, it does not matter to me. It has, this has a component disconnect. This has a thematic disconnect to me. Don't care one bit. Okay. Don't care one bit. I, it, the gameplay of this is so rock solid. Sure. I, I could care less. I like it a lot. Yeah. I like this game. No, I think, I, think it's, I think it's fantastic. I think that there's even a bluffing element to it too. Yes. It's not a super strong bluffing element, but no. it's, certainly, it's certainly there. Um, whether or not I'm holding back, you know, a green, like my high green card. To play to, to my hometown or whatnot. So there's a lot to enjoy about, about the gameplay here. An absolute ton. Yes. So, final thoughts. I went first last time. You're up, Alex. Yeah, I'm going to straight up buy this. Okay. As soon as I can or however I can. Because this is awesome. Uh, it's an awesome game. The tension of this. The the trying not to have more than the hometown. The, the, the balance of that. The different cards that go in. Regardless of whether they're discs, uh, squares, what have you. It doesn't matter. The tension of that just works in this one. It really works in this, Sean. Uh, I enjoy the fact that you have different... Uh, you feel clever in this. You can feel clever in... Oh, yeah. I reduced this one by just enough to where I'm, I'm underneath it, and I forced you to lose all of your cards, and that got wiped. And, oh, but I didn't see that coming from my right. This guy also manipulates... There's a lot going on, a lot to think here, but done with a fairly simple rule set. One that can take a little bit to get, but a fairly simple rule set. And I think for this... For this I don't know if it'll be in my top 10, but I'm willing to give this one a straight up six. Okay. I'm willing to give this one a straight up six. I enjoy it that much. It's going to be my top 10 of the year for sure. And yeah, it's not thematic 
and the component <laughs> choice there is 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 odd. But I I straight up love this game. So six is an all time favorite. That's a contender for the top ten. Yes. Okay. So um. So yeah, I I expected I expected you to at least have this at a five. So I'm not I'm not super surprised by that. I flirted with a six on this. Yeah. Um. And for whatever reason, it just doesn't quite get there, and I I can't quite articulate why. I highly suspect this will be in my top ten of the year. Absolutely. I think I think this is an incredible game. Um. It's going to be a five. It's going to be a very solid five. A great game will rarely turn down a play of it. Um, I see why this was kind of you know one of the sleeper hits of Essen. Uh, I this was highly recommended to me by Mike Fitzgerald. Highly recommended to me by Suzanne. And I completely see why. I mean, they both have excellent tastes, uh, and certainly you know came across here. But for what uh, I just for, I don't know why I'm I'm holding back from a six. But for some reason, is it the weight of game? Um. No, not necessarily. Because you don't well, tend to give out sixes to this weight of game other than, say, Seven Wonders Duel. Right, right. So, I mean, maybe... So here's Is the it question. a filler six? Is it a filler six? Right, that's that's what I'm... I don't know if it's quite filler length, though. The rounds are certainly reasonably fast, but there's enough with the drafting. We didn't even talk a lot about the drafting. The drafting's in here, and yeah. it works pretty well, too. Right, because and what's interesting is sometimes you want low cards. Low cards that... Because maybe you want to not send high values to the capital. Um, maybe you want high cards. So there's a nice, te- there's no, a two, a yellow two is not inherently better or worse than a yellow six. Right. You know? Um, but it depends on your situation exactly. and your hometown and what the board state is and all Ex- that. Exactly. So I mean, I'm, I'm going to stick with this five for now. Okay. And, um, we're going to see, we're going to see how much this gets played over the next year. And maybe at the double take, it, it might go up. I don't see this going down. Sure. Um, I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a very solid game. Notice I'm not giving it a filler five. <laughs> Whatever difference that makes. So yeah. I gave Love and Englishman a filler five. I'm giving this a there's this like a, a separate five. secret scale. Yeah, exactly. And I can't tell you what what I can't tell you what that difference is. Um, but it's a very solid five for me. A, a great game. We'll rarely turn down a play of it. I'm I'm hesitant to do what Suzanne does and take a lot of these smaller games and put them in you know a a, a box. I like keeping my boxes and I and but I, I'm I'm I would love to always make sure that I have access to this game. So very, very solid five. I'm going to buy this. Okay. Yeah. Straight up, I'm going to buy this. Well, I'm glad I bought mine. Yep. When I did. Good job, Sean. All right. Well, that's going to do it then for our review of Capital Lux. A six for Alex and a five for Sean. So go check this game from Aporta Games out. You are listening to the Dukes of Dice, proud members of the Dice Tower Network. For other great shows in the network, check out Dicetowernetwork.com. Back to Alex and Sean for this week's Duke's Double Take. So, Sean, I done screwed up. Oh. I done screwed up. Okay. So, episode 68 is what we're looking back to. <laughs> or episode 69. It's one of those. Okay. I think it's episode 69. Episode 69. The Drunks of Drafting. Yeah. Is the name of the episode. So, we actually did two reviews that week. Oh, we, you didn't put it in the guild for... I sure duel. did not, and I think we're just going to save that double take yeah. for next week. Yeah, yeah, we'll save is, that. Is the best approach, because, boy, oh boy, Viticulture alone set off a firestorm of debate. So, so let's, let's, let's talk about a couple of things. Number one, last year you gave it a culture of six. Yes. I gave it a culture of six. So, therefore, it is a Boxcars Award winner. Yes. Whenever the, a game gets a six from you and a six from me... With our kind of divergent taste in games, that's that's a big deal. Capital Lux just missed out. Just missed out, yeah. Now, so, okay. I love this game. I love Viticulture. Um, it's been my experience that it's been universally loved. Huh. But, but until, then you, <laughs> until the last week. And then you found out. Yeah, until the last, like, that's just been kind of my impression. That it's just universally loved. Everyone loves Viticulture. And, uh, but so we had some interesting discussion on our guild that has now shattered that, uh, impression of mine. You are, you are out of your bubble. Yeah. Your viticulture bubble. Well, let's start with one who was in our bubble first though. BJ from board game gumbo says viticulture is my number one favorite game. It is easily a six for me on the Duke scale. Top 10 stays in my collection. We'll play anytime. Best of all time. I love how easy it is to teach from a thematic standpoint. We're going to grow some wine. Think of the four steps, etc. I love how even the most experienced gamer can look at the game and come up with a different ways to win. Fine winemaking strategy, low point cheap Merlot strategy, no wine at all, guest only strategy, or any combination. I have the essential edition, and that's the one I recommend. Plus, you get the metal coins uh, that Stonemeyer sells now. 
you get a great sized board, lots of cards, the addition of the mamas and papas, and the game has enough take that in it, but is still forgiving to new players. I've yet to have a bad time with it. I've played it a dozen times just since this summer. It has tons of replayability. Great components, plays in about one to two hours, depending on player count. It has tons of replayability, great components, and plays in about one to two hours, depending upon player count and experience level. Plus, it has one of the best solo player experiences of any game, a keeper by any definition. Dave S., also a big fan of this one, talking about uh, it is one of my wife's favorite games and one that I love to play with her. We enjoy adding bits of Tuscany in, but also really enjoy the simple elegance of the base game for two players. We can play through it quickly in an evening while eating dinner, so it's a great go-to. Okay, so so that kind of ends ends the bubble, right? We're at, now we're gonna we're gonna go out of the bubble, Alex. Oh yeah, very much so. So Megan Naxer says, first of all, I love wine. I love visiting wineries. I was so excited to try this game for the theme and art alone, and those bits swoon. The more and more I played this game, the more and more I disliked it. I know I'm in the minority here, but the game's dependence on the various card decks really killed the game for me. Yes, I've played it several times with Tuscany. I really wanted to love this game, but just don't. The amount of luck in drawing the right cards at the right time, getting vine cards and order cards to line up, is just too much luck on top of everything else going on. So many games feel like I'm taking actions in order to try and get the right cards, or getting the right cards and enjoying the engine with someone else at the table, staring in disbelief at their hand. Couple this with a few five-player games that have taken well over three hours, and I will take a hard pass on this game. A high two out of six. With Tuscany, you might convince me to play it with no more than four. That's a slam right there. Yeah. And then Paul Naxer, her husband, chimes in. During my hello play, I marveled... Hello. At- hello. On young. Uh, I marveled at the more experienced players gobbling up cards and getting their game moving toward the win. It was frustrating coming back to it thinking I had a shot and never getting the card combos to work. Sadly, a pass. Two of six. So, okay. So let's let's talk about this a little bit. I, I get that. I have played this game with abysmal card draws, just abysmal card draws. So, uh, so a little bit of context. Viticulture is a worker placement game where you are uh, taking care of this winery and you're trying to be the first 20 points. And then whoever has the most uh, after 20 points is, is the winner. Um, there are actions that let you, that let you uh, plant grapes in your field or put them in your field, whatever, harvest the field, um, sell them, fill, fill wine contracts, but there's a ton of card play. You have these visitor cards, summer visitors and winter visitors, and you get one uh, each round. There are actions that let you get more. There are buildings that you can upgrade your winery with that will let you get more. Um, and these visitor cards, some of them are are universally solid. Like they're just all, in any situation, they're good. Some of them are very strong conditionally. In the Situational, right, the yeah. right In the right situation, right. And so I've had games where I've drawn all situational cards when I couldn't, when I couldn't use them. And I've had, I mean, abysmal, abysmal, but I still actually did well. It was, it, they were, they were somewhat frustrating plays. Um, but looking back, I don't really, I don't really mind it for whatever reason. I can understand why some people that would be a huge turnoff for, uh, but for whatever reason, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm okay. I, I enjoy the card play. Um, and BJ is going to kind of chime back in here in a second with, uh, with some thoughts about that. But, for whatever reason, I like the randomness and I like, I like that card play. Um, I like that there's some mitigation there and there are things you can do to even mitigate that luck. But for whatever reason, I'm, I'm okay with all of that. So what, what, what else does BJ have to say? So BJ chimes back in. The only thing that I take from that purely anecdotal evidence is that card draw supplements efficient play but does not replace it. Except in the case with laughably bad card draws, say all low grapes of the same color, junky visitor cards in relation to your vineyard's needs, production... A good player, efficient in her moves, can still maneuver to the top. Even with a bad draw or two, the windmill itself mitigates that to a large degree. If you can get six to eight extra visitor cards after the purchase of the windmill, that will lessen the impact of one or two bad card draws. So I think BJ might be talking about the cottage card, which gives you the extra card, not the windmill. Yeah. Um, So we were talking the other night at Empire about, you know, about about this discussion and how, how vital is it to get the cottage? It seems it seems pretty necessary. Oh yeah. So some people might find that to be a fault of the game that you have to at least at least do this. I, I don't know that that's necessarily a problem for me. There was a question of well, how many players can get it first round, and I think two to three, maybe more, depending on on card draw, visitor cards. But then if even if you build it the second round, you're you're still only out one one card, and you might have done other things in the meantime. Yeah. So I don't think that that's that's super troubling. Uh, necessarily. Yeah, it could be. 
Um, it, it is correct, though, that the more cards you're getting, the better you're likely to do in this game. Yeah. Although a lot of the game is geared that way. For instance, you get extra cards if you land on certain spots, extra vine cards, extra order right. cards. So, uh, but yeah, getting the cottage early certainly helps. So yeah, getting and playing cards is, is a big part of this. Yeah. But I think the other key is, is playing cards is the other element of that. You might have to sacrifice going earlier in the turn order just to, to play more cards. Sure. I, I will say, I, I, in preparation for this double take, I actually did play this one on Wednesday at the Dukes of Dice game night. And I just stomped folks. <laughs> stomped. Stomped. Uh, Grapes. Yes. Good, good Giant, job. Giants. Yeah. Which we'll, we'll talk we're about getting later. that later. We're talking about that later. Anyway. Yeah. Spoiler alert, I guess. Good job, Jason Lees, for that episode <laughs> title suggestion that got worked in. Uh, and a lot of it just came down to card draw. Um, so, that's as long as you know that going in, maybe not such a bad thing. Yeah, it's a worker placement game where you don't have perfect information, where there is the, the random card draw. And I, I mean, I guess you just need to be okay with that. And um, yeah, and be I, okay with it, guys. No, no, no. I'm not. No, no. I'm not saying. I'm not saying anyone. That, I mean, if people don't like a game, they don't like a game. That's fine. Um, but yeah, I think there's there's probably a level of expectation there. And so yeah, I want to play this with Tuscany. I still yeah. have maybe one module of Tuscany, but there's so many in there uh-huh. to add to this. And I really, I really want to play with more stuff added into the mix, which may or may not mitigate some of the luck or add more elements, but. Even just base game, there's a there's a good amount going on here for sure. Okay, so. yeah, no, I, I agree completely. Um, so Ned Myers says Viticulture is my number one game of all time. So that's two two people now. Uh, being a Stonemaier game, the entire production's top notch. Yeah, the art and the cards isn't anything to display on your wall, but the overall graphic design is great and it looks really good on the table. I love the depth of strategy with the simplicity of the rules. And the Grande Worker is such a great addition to the worker placement genre. It gives you that extra choice when some jerk blocks the spot you really, really need. I think he's talking about Alex there. And and adding in the Tuscany Tuscany expansion just adds so much to the game. I love that you can plug in modules from the Super Light and Random Mafia expansion to the game-changing extended board. I will champion this game until the day I die. It's just that good. But then on the other side, Eugene Chavez chimed in with uh, referencing... Megan's thoughts, yeah. that, that she echoed his thoughts almost exactly. I have snarked that a key strategy in the game is draw well. Also, I'm definitely not one to be up in arms about artwork, but even I do find the visitor card art to be mostly ghastly. Hmm. So, let's, uh, let's see where we're at here, Alex. So, sure. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go first. Sure. I have played this game, oh, I don't know, half a dozen times since our, since our review. I love it. I still continue to love it. I love that it's a, a meaty enough. It's not a super heavy game. I mean, it's probably a solid medium, I think. Um, it's a meaty enough worker placement game. I enjoy, the, I enjoy the randomness of the cards. I enjoy that card play, which makes sense given the type of gamer I, that, I, that I am. Um, and I could see how, for some people, it's like, hey, you're, you're – Ameritrash randomness got mixed into my Euro. Right. And that could be a turnoff for some people. No, my Euro got mixed into your Ameritrash <laughs> randomness. So I'm, I'm going to keep this at a six. This is still an all-time favorite, a contender for the top ten. Um, I, I I love playing this game. It's something. It's a game, when, you know, we're talking about bringing out a game where I'll think of it a culture to, to pull out. And I've and it's, and it's happened. It's it, I've gotten plenty of plays of this in the last year. So for me, it's going to stay a six. I, I love this game. So I was almost influenced by the guild pretty pretty strongly <laughs> on this one because the bubble did get burst for well, sure. Well, I came over to you. I'm like, so what, what are you thinking now? And you're like, mm, I don't like, know about these card draws. Yeah, I'm like, that's the guild talking, Alex. Yeah, it might have been. Uh, so this is kind of in the same place that Elysium was in for me. And Elysium, in in retrospect, probably I should have kept at a six. Yeah, you should have, you big jerk. A- and it in so in the Duke's triple take. Uh, it's, it's a six. Elysium. So that's, that's now canonical in oh. case anyone's keeping the story of this. Elysium. Yes. Okay. What did I just say? I'm just making sure. Oh yeah. Elys- sure. Elysium is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, base, base, base viticulture. Oh God. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so I think I've realized that, that unless there's a good reason not to leave something where it is, you should probably just leave it where it is. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just going to leave it where it is. All right. It was not in consideration for my top 10 of all time. It, it didn't come close to making the list. Scythe was a, like a no-brainer. Yeah. It's on the list. Yeah. This, this one did not I – didn't, I didn't think about it in the context of, of oh, this is going to make my list. Yeah. But I still think there's room for it to belong. I, I'm going to be less strict about that stuff now, I think. Uh, and and I, I, I'm willing to keep this one at a six, especially because it has so much variability with Tuscany added in right. potentially. I, I'm kind of giving it credit for potential – variability, <laughs> uh, which is something I couldn't do, for instance, with Elysium, although it, I know the variability it has in the game. 
Uh, no, no word or word that the expansions may be. It, apparently, the the expansion for Elysium was uh, was designed and done, but for some reason, it's not going to get published. Weird. Yeah, very disappointing. That's a shame. They should kickstart that because I think they'd be successful. I think people need to have the rights to it to do that. Oh well, that could be it. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> So I'm gonna keep it at a six. Uh, it, I think it's still a, still a worthy game. I I enjoy the card draw component of this too. I yeah. enjoy that you have yeah. to you have to work around that. You have to decide. There's there's tough choices of where do I play here first? Do I want to fulfill this order and get the extra bonus point, or do I really need to be harvesting multiple fields? Well, I now have this space on my board. How do I budget my guys from from uh, from spring to fall? What where do they go? So no, there's enough satisfying here to me that I, that I'm still keeping it at a six. But a little more tentative of a six than it might have been a year ago, I guess. Okay. For whatever that's worth. All right. Fair enough. Well, all right. Well, that's going to do it for our Duke's double take of Viticulture. It's going to stay a six and a six from both of us. Of course, uh, still a Boxcars Award winner. We're going to have a big announcement for you after the break. But first, a quick word about our sponsor. Alex. Yes, yeah, Sean. Do you know it's my favorite time of year? What's that, Sean? Is it is it Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Christmas? No, it's Feldmas. Oh, a merry Feldmas to you. And to you, Alex. You know, our uh, fine sponsors over at Tasty Minstrel Games have a brand new game just in time for Feldmas from one of our favorite designers, Stefan Feld. Oracle of Delphi. And I got to play this at BGG Con, and it was awesome. And this is uh, this is a pick up and deliver one, right? It is. And I was surprised to like it as much as I did. That's a great way to spend your Feldbiss. But hey, we don't want to leave everyone out. We want to be inclusive here. Tasty Minstrel also has a reprint of Gates of Loyang from Uwe Rosenberg. So if you want to celebrate Rosenbergica, oh you, boy. you can do that with Gates of Loyang. I guess that's a thing now. That is a thing. So to everyone... Merry Feldmas and happy Rosenbergica. And check out all of TMG's titles at playtmg.com. All right, so we've got a big announcement. The duchy is is crumbling around us. Oh, it's crashing. It's crashing down. So dramatic. What's going on, Alex? What's going on? Stuff is going down, all Sean. Right. Like a lot of stuff is going down. Not for you so much. Everyone at home, sit down. Make sure you're seated. Buckled in. If you have if you have seatbelts on your yeah. couch, <laughs> use them. What was that show? Th- on this M- announcement's so exciting. You'll pay for the whole seat, but you're just gonna need the edge. Anyway, go on, <laughs> go on, go on. Um. All right. So this is gonna get like very non board gamery in in sections here. <laughs> okay. Very non board gamery. Uh. So for folks who know who've listened to the show, I am currently. A uh, news anchor for a local CBS affiliate here in Albuquerque. I have, for reasons I won't get too deep into, just kind of gotten pretty burned out on the whole thing. There was also a scandal. That there was no Which scandal. We can't, we can't go into oh detail God. about. But basically, <laughs> you skimmed something. There was some pay-to-play stuff. Well, and then and there was the time I just I read the prompter and someone put a bunch of curse words in it. Yep. And I was I pulled a Ron Burgundy. Yeah, sure did. Yeah, it just yeah. And then someone punted punted Don off of a bridge. Yep. Yeah, your dog. Yeah, my yeah. dog Don. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I've been, I've been getting pretty burned out about it, and I've, I've known since pretty early in the year that when my contract was up, pretty soon after that, I was going to be done. So sure enough, uh, I have set a last day uh, for about from when you're listening to this episode, a little less than two weeks. So December twenty first is my last day at KRQE. Separately from all of this, about two years ago, uh, I was looking to. Uh, I had kind of a fork in the road. I could either kind of sign up to be an anchor, and I hadn't been an anchor yet, or I was, I'd was i already applied and done all of the things necessary to go teach English in Korea. I didn't go that route. I went another route. But there was a bit of a kind of a travel bug. So, okay, we'll get to the travel bug thing because that's the major, major part of this in a second. <laughs> Separately from all of this, something I have not discussed on the show and really gotten into, gone through a breakup. Uh, I was with Jillian, who folks have heard on the show for quite a while. And for a number of reasons, which again, I'm not going to get into on this show, uh, we are now no longer together. And um, we've been together for about five years, pretty long, long-term long relationship. Uh, no kids, weren't married, uh, had, had a dog and a cat. And there's a good amount of life change going on there. Sure. Good amount of life change. And as part of all of that, I, I myself don't have kids. I don't have, own a home that here you know of. that I that I know of. I don't own a home here. Uh, I don't know what I want to do career wise. Mm-hmm. Just straight up, don't know. I know it. I'm 
not so stoked on the news business right now. I do know one thing. I know that I really want to travel. Okay. I want to I wanna just travel for a while. Wander the earth. Uh, so, January 11th, I am flying to Stockholm with my brother and my dad. We're going to spend a week and a half uh, kind of in, in uh, Sweden and a little bit in Norway and a little bit in Denmark. And then they're going to go back to the States and I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going east and hop on a plane to Bangkok. I'm going to land in Bangkok, Thailand. And I'm kind of in that Southeast Asia part of the world for about two and a half months, just kind of doing my thing. And then I have a flight out of Bali. I'll be in Australia for another two weeks after that. And then I'll be in New Zealand for a week after that. And then I'm going to come back to the States. And who the heck knows what comes after that? That being said, (laughs) as you might imagine, show-wise, that's going to make it pretty tough for me to do a weekly podcast. Yep, sure will. Certainly to play enough games to review for said weekly podcast, especially enough new games to review for said weekly podcast. So... As a result of all of that, uh, I'm going to be on a bit of a hiatus. I'm yes. not gone for good. I'm still going to be kind of floating around, probably. <laughs> uh, but but I am going to be gone for a good chunk of time. The show's not coming to an end. Nope. I'm not gone forever, but I will be gone for a significant period of time. I think we looked at this. It's something like 14, 15, 16 episodes. Uh, four, 14 episodes, I think we said. Somewhere in that range. Yeah. I'm gone for a good three and a half months. Yeah. Just traveling. Traveling, traveling, traveling. Sean, yes, you got some stuff to figure out. I do well, we, and it's mostly it's we've done mostly some planning on this. Figured out. So yeah. you know, one of the things that I hear a lot of times about you know people listening to the show is that they enjoy they enjoy our interaction because I mean we're just we're just two more guys talking about board games, and there's there's plenty of that out there. Um, so that's I mean that's one of my concerns. I mean the show's gonna gonna continue on while you're while you're gone, um, and we'll talk about it here in a second. But, I mean, I think that that's definitely, for whatever reason, people like our interaction. I mean, personally, our interaction drives me crazy. Yeah. But for whatever reason, people people enjoy this interaction. It was, and we talked about this recently in kind of the st- the broader state of the duchy. Yeah. But it, it was the one thing, early on, I was skeptical about what made the show special. Right. And it turned out to just kind of be the interaction of us, is at least from what right. I hear from folks. Yeah, and and I feel like I've I've heard that I've heard that quite a bit. Okay, so here's the plan for those fourteen weeks. So we're gonna we're gonna still have weekly episodes, and we're gonna kind of switch the format every other week. Um, so in one week, we're gonna have a special guest on, um, media personality. I've already talked to some people. We've got most of them lined up in principle, and now we're going to kind of hammer down the, the actual details. It definitely won't be Suzanne. No, never. Of course not. Yeah, no. Suzanne graciously, of, of course, as always, as, uh, as a Duke, has agreed to, to step in. Um, and then we've got some other board game media people um, that have kind of you know, committed, and we're just going gonna to line those up uh, with specific dates. But basically, every other week, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do that. Then in those other weeks, we're going to have kind of a local, a local crew, um, and that hasn't quite been figured out, figured out yet. But basically, um, people that either have been on the show, either you've heard them in our, our Extra Life episodes or they, they come in on the show every now and then, um, or you've heard us mention them or whatever. And to kind of, so there's still that local connection. I mean, it's not meant to, you know, to replicate what Alex and I have, but at least so that we can continue to do game reviews. Because it's really difficult to do a game review with a special guest just because you kind of have to coordinate, hey, I need you to get enough plays of this out ahead there of time. Yeah. ahead of time. So those those special guest episodes may be g- game reviews, but more likely they may be a top six or, or something like that. But then we'll still have game reviews with the, kind of the, the local crew. And it's a little bit difficult to, um, to commit to our schedule. Like that's one of the things that, um, that has enabled us to do this weekly is that – Whatever happens, for the most part, we make sure that this this weekly episode happens. It's it's been a priority, and so that's really hard to to ask someone for fourteen weeks, even every other week, to to kind of commit to that to that schedule. Um, so there might be there might be some people kind of floating in and out, um, and also the idea was that we would have you know maybe two extra people, two extra locals at a time, just to kind of make sure that there's enough of enough of interaction. It's not just, it's not just the Sean show, which mm, you're probably going to turn into the Sean show. Well, no, well, we're, we're working on that. We're working on that. So, so that's the plan. I mean, um, and then ideas, you know, have you pop in from time to time as your, your schedule permits? I'll have my laptop, uh, with me. So you might hear show intros. You might hear. So here's the other piece of this that I think is hopefully is going to be really cool. Yeah. 
I'm going to be traveling to a lot of places where folks who listen to us uh, are. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. So we did this a while ago. There was a, a kind of a map of the Greater Duchy thread on the Guild. Yeah. And I think we were both pretty stunned oh, yeah. to see the spread of, of just where people are and where people listen to us. So... I don't think there's people in every country, but I know, for instance, there's a couple listeners in Australia. I know uh, Chris, a.k.a. Ghidorah, is in uh, South Korea, which isn't quite Southeast Asia. It's a little bit off the beaten path, but who knows? Maybe we meet somewhere in between. But in any case, if you're listening to us from one of those kind of countries or, or parts of the world I listed when I was kind of going through all that, I'd love to meet up with you and get in the game. Absolutely love to do that. One... Uh, I'm not going to be able to travel with a ton of stuff games-wise. So I'm going to have a gaming itch that's, that's going to need to be scratched in some form <laughs> or fashion. So uh, help scratch my gamer itch. Gross. Yeah, kind of gross. gross. Phrasing. Uh, so I'm going to put up a thread on the guild. Uh, and then uh, also I'm going to give out my email address just for folks if they want to email me and say, hey, I live in this place. I don't feel like getting on the guild, but I feel like emailing you. Yeah. Uh, it's alex.j.goldsmith at gmail.com. I think I also have a Dukes of Dice email, but I've never, nope, never logged into it. it. Nope. nope. There's probably a bunch of uh, bunch of baseball highlights fan art in there or something. <laughs> anyway. Uh, fan fiction? Baseball yeah, highlights fan fiction? Yeah, sure. Uh, there is. That actually is not about fan fiction, but there is a fiction to it. Anyway. Yeah, I know. I there's know. a whole story. I'm just... All right. Uh, so, I, if, if in any case, if I'm if I'm in a part of the world that you're in, please, please, please do not hesitate to reach out because I want to I wanna meet up and say hi. So, so here's what I imagine. You, you're you're too old, or not too old. You're too young for Fraggle Rock, right? Yeah, a little. So there was tra- uh There was uh, uh, what's the, oh, what's the main Fraggle's name? I can't remember his name. But he had a tra- he had an uncle, traveling Matt, who would who would be exploring the world of the humans and would always like report back about how strange these humans are. Uh, I, I envision you as traveling Matt. I'll show you a picture of him at some point. All right, fair enough. Well, I'm gonna go travel and be Matt. I guess. Yes. All right. So, yeah, that's the big announcement. Okay. So, yes, the duchy is still here. The duchy is strong. <laughs> the state of the duchy is strong. And stronger without Alex. Um, yeah, so, well, no, not, not, not yeah, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Finally, Aww. the albatross around my neck. <laughs> You're going to find, maybe you'll find that out. Like, oh, man, I, I'm really good at this stuff without Alex here. Yeah. No, I don't think that's going to be the case. All right, well. So, um, so yeah, I'm... One of the things you know that I've that I've talked about is we've we are we are growing we are we have fantastic growth. Um, our listenership is I'm very happy with with the listenership. I'm very happy with everyone that that reaches out to us and connects to us on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, on our guild, of course. Um, and I'm a little I'm a little bit scared. I'm a little bit scared that that that's either going to plateau or that's gonna or that's gonna fall off. Um, just because it's, it's a change, you know, changes, changes scary. Uh, this, I mean, you you have your own change, obviously. Oh yeah. That you're, that you're going through a lot of it. And this is, you know, this is a change for the, for the duchy. Um, I mean, we're still going to be putting out the content We're we're still going to be, you know, producing that weekly show, but I mean, there's recognition that it's not, it's going to be different. It's going to be a different production. Um, and I, I think the commitment now is to kind of keep mostly keep that the typical format the way it is. But we'll just have to see as the as the weeks progress. So, by my estimation, Alex, then you have three, maybe four episodes after this one drops. Sure. So, yeah. you, so you leave on January 11th, right? Um, so the the episode that would drop on the 9th that we would potentially record on the seventh that Saturday. I don't know if you're going to be in a position to record. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Oh yeah. All right. So four episodes. Oh yeah. yeah. You got a month a month's worth of episodes. Yeah, I got months left. worth of Duke Alex. <laughs> um. So yeah. That's that's where we're at. Yep. Yep. A lot of a lot of stuff. Lots. A lot of it, and a lot of stuff that's been going on for me for a long while that sure. I just have not felt in a position to talk about or wanted to talk about for different reasons. Right. So thanks for bearing with me. Yep. Uh. <laughs> all right. I will say this. Um. I'm not. I'm certain. The one thing that I'm going to miss the most, probably, besides my parents. Love my parents. <laughs> is uh, is the community here? The fact that that we have such a great community here in Albuquerque that's yeah. that's been built up. Uh, I'm gonna miss seeing folks on Wednesdays. Uh, I'm gonna miss I'm gonna miss sitting down and recording this with you, Sean, because sure. it's a lot of fun every week. Not uh, the edit. Well, I don't do any edit. No, I know, but the recording's fun. Yeah, so I don't have to worry about the edit. That's all, that's on you, dude. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to miss that, and I'm going to miss listeners. I'm going to try and hopefully meet up with some. Anyway, that's my big announcement. Hey, here are the naming runner-up. Wait, I have an announcement, too. What? I'm super excited to do today's edit because I have a, I have a new computer 
that I bought from uh, from our buddy Jared. All right. And it's super fast. Great. You no, know, I'm super excited. It's going to shave so much off bedding time. I, I'm happy for you. That's my announcement. Good job. Hey. That seems, that hey, seems just was, as life-changing and dramatic. I was supportive of your big announcement. <laughs> okay, fine. Uh, all right, naming runner-ups. Really quick before we go, Jason Lee's came with Stomp. Which made perfect sense. Yeah, we, it's a giant and it's grapes. You're stomping grapes. Yeah, we referenced that a bit. Earlier. And in Capital Lux, you're stomping out oppression in the main city. Nope, you're no, not because the that capital, theme isn't there. The capital is stomping it's, your hometown out. Right. If you get if you get too big for your britches, that's that is the exact phrase I was about to use. Very oh, good. Excellent. Uh, Todd Kauk came with "You're So Vine," which works for you, both viticulture and blood of Englishmen. Yeah. You probably think this game is about you. I think this show is so about... Vine. Anyway. Uh, all right. Fair enough. Yep. John Giblin came with Vinecraft, which is... Yeah, I like to play on yeah, Minecraft. Pretty, Minecraft, pretty yeah. solid. Neil Hoffman with probably my favorite of the week, even though it wasn't <laughs> one that we'd ever name an episode. Uh, Faba Beanstalk and a nice candy. That's not my voice for the... I'm not, I've never actually seen the movie, but Sil- I know the Silence reference. Of the I've seen the scene. Yeah. Uh, and then he goes... <laughs> I'm I'm shocked you haven't seen that movie. No, are you no, Are I'm you not. shocked? I'm All right, not, I'm not shocked. Uh, and then finally, rounding it out, Scott Sexton and Scott. I told you, any name you have in the top six is going to be in the friendly Shogun voice. So let me go get him. Hello, friends. It's me, the Shogun here. I was busy sipping on my oolong tea, but I noticed Scott Sexton submitted another name. Are you Are you scared by my tentacles again, Sean? No, I'm not scared. They're I, pretty spooky. I I peed a little bit, but Merry Christmas, by the way. Uh, and happy holidays. We we don't celebrate Christmas around here. We celebrate Feldmas, but... I celebrate all sorts of things you don't want to know about. We also... Ce- well, <laughs> I, never mind. Scott's name this week was Lux to be you. <laughs> Can you... Because hear- for the 14 weeks when I'm gone, I mean, Alex is gone, blah, 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 it's going to Lux to be you. So that's Lux to be you, just in case you couldn't tell from the Shoggoths poor enunciation. Hello, Fred. It's hard to talk with all those tentacles coming out of your mouth. Blah, 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 blah. Would you like some tea? I brought some more for you. Why are you so obsessed with tea you from the Shogun? You don't. You don't. <laughs> you don't seem like you needed as much this week. No, I'm better. I'm better this week. Thanks, friend the Shogun. You're welcome. Blah, can, blah, you get, blah, blah, can you go get Alex back now, please? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> oh, you're good. You're you're back. Yeah, it's really slimy on this one this time. Yep. All right. Anyway, that's gonna do it. All right. Well, that's gonna do it for episode 121. Um, Fortunately, while you're gone, Alex, the friendly Shoggoth will uh, not be messing up the studio. Wait, anymore. I came back. I have some paninis. Oh, <laughs> no. All right. 121 in the bag. Uh, Panini Lux, for you. Lux, Lux, <laughs> Goose. Until next time, this is Sean, the friendly Shoggoth, and... Alex. <laughs> Dale Hydra. Thank you so much for listening to the Dukes of Dice. Today's episode was recorded in the Duchy on December 10th, 2016. Our theme music provided by Carbohydro M from his Prime Legacy album. The Dukes of Dice are a proud member of the Dice Tower Network. For other great board gaming podcasts, check out Dicetowernetwork.com. And for all the latest in the Dutchie, go to DukesofDice.com. Find us on Twitter at Dukes of Dice. Join in conversations on our Board Game Geek Guild. Find us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks to our sponsors, Tasty Minstrel Games and Meeple Realty. Check out all their awesome titles at PlayTMG.com. And for high-quality board game inserts, check out MeepleRealty.com. Meeple Realty. Think inside the box. We'll see you back here next week. Until then... Game on! So when you're when you're traveling uh, throughout the world, are you going to be playing Pathfinder with just anyone you meet? Sure. Oh, that sounds ironic. So here's the thing. What? By the way, so separate 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 How's thing. That ironic? No, it's not ironic. Don't worry. I'm, you're, I just, had, you're just throwing words out. It's something no else sense. I was going to say. We'll Get off say my it. back. All say right. It. So Steve O'Rourke, the name father, actually was kind of aware of this announcement and uh, passed along a secret name. That he didn't post to the thread because he didn't want to oh. give away the announcement. So his secret name was Wandering Vines. Ah. Oh. So the idea being the capital and capital lux away from your hometown. Mm-hmm. Beans and grapes grown on uh, grown on vines. Sure. And uh, the surprise topic is the sub- plan to take a sabbatical. Hey, the wandering works too. There you go. So didn't make the top six because I forgot that he had sent that to me. <laughs> but. Good job, Alex. But, but good job, name father. Though Chris Schreiber is catching up to you. Uh-oh. Yeah, he's on your tail. Like a like a bogey. Watch out. Hey Sean, it's me, the friendly Shogath. About to run my friendly Panera. I'm gonna hit, I'm gonna stop recording now. <laughs> it's I I have soups. You can get a, you can get a pick too. And stop. <laughs>